welcome again. <laughs> Hopefully a little bit more refreshed. So um, I don't know if some of you know me, miraculously, but um, my name's Venerable Chanda. Um, I'm from England, as you can probably imagine. And um, I'm in New York to visit a very special friend of mine who um, I actually served my first retreats with in 1996. So um, it's another Dhamma connection being here. Um, so yeah, I started to practice back in 96 and um, ordained in 2006 in Burma. And for the last five, four or five years, I've been in Perth with uh, my teacher Ajahn Brown. But it's very unfair for nuns because they kick you out really quickly. So <laughs> monks get to stay with their teachers for, I don't know, 10, 20 years. But um, for nuns, it's quite different because we don't have many places um, established. So as soon as you get a little bit um, used to the robes, they say, OK, off you go. Go and do something. So um, my mission now is to start something in England for, for bhikkhunis so that we can take full ordination and, you know, lay women can come and stay in the monastery as well. So, um, yeah, so it's a very different lifestyle for me. And um, I'm just kind of getting used to my new role, which is, yeah, developing in many ways. So this is just the beginning of me starting to teach a little bit. So for me, tonight is more about sharing than me being here, you know, explaining my path to you. So... At any time, you know, please just ask questions or, you know, direct it in a direction that's um, interesting for you. Yeah. So, I thought we'd talk about the soft mind, which is maybe a, a slightly unusual concept for people. It is mentioned in the suttas in many places because um, the Buddha says that a soft mind is one that's free from hindrances. And it's... Uh, not only easily attains samadhi, which is stillness, but it's also a product of samadhi. So when we practice to calm the mind, the mind becomes very soft. It doesn't mean it just becomes like a blob, you know, that runs all over the place. It more means that it's malleable and that you can um, use the mind in any way that you want to. So rather than being kind of controlled by all the hindrances, you know, you know what the hindrances are, I imagine. So the things which disturb our, our um, mind, not only our meditation, but our, our mind in everyday life. So forces such as um, sensual desire, when it's very intense, you know, and we feel like compelled to, to get something or to have something, you know. Even a chocolate cake suddenly appears like the solution to everything, you know. <laughs> um, and then ill will is the second one. Uh, and it's interesting, ill will is quite nuanced actually. People feel that it, it means anger or, or even hatred, it's sometimes translated. But um, it comes out in so many ways, and that's another reason I wanted to talk about the soft mind, because so many of us are very hard on ourselves, you know. And we actually have a very subtle underlying aversion in our attitude to experience, in our attitude to ourselves in many situations but also in the practice you know so we sit down and we already have like expectations and ideas of where we want to get to in our meditation which is actually not the point at all it's just to make peace with where we already are um which is something i learned from my teacher Ajahn Brahm you know it was quite a revelation to me that you could sit down and um notice that there was contentment already there in the mind you know? Once we let go of these preconceived ideas about how experience should be and understand that whatever we experience is, is nature, you know, it's just arising, it's not personal, then there can actually be a lot of contentment right away. So, so yeah, I feel that, you know, we're all quite expert these days in the West, especially those of us who have been to meditation centers and practice with all kinds of different teachers. We all know various methods and approaches to the practice but to me focusing on attitude is, is really key and it's something that you can take into anything that you do whether it's daily life or it's meditation on the cushion you know whether you're practicing body awareness or breath meditation or metta which is almost like a direct cultivation of um, these beautiful states of softness and acceptance 
So really looking at the attitude, you know, with which we meet experience can be quite transforming. And I think it's the heart of the Buddha's teaching because it's in the attitude that there's the freedom to actually release some of the clinging that we have towards experience. You know, so rather than things having to be just the way we want them to be, which is very difficult, you know, it takes a lot of work or sometimes people spend their whole lives you know, trying to arrange things that way. You know, we're very careful with our friends, very careful with you know, our partners, but people change. Or we have a, one view of the person and then when you live with somebody it's quite a different thing. You know? So we can't always control that. But what we can do is control, not control, but we can influence our attitude if we notice how we are actually contributing to the problem. So I was on a retreat quite recently and um, I was doing a lot of metta practice and at first the metta was going very smoothly, like a lot of metta coming up and um, you know, sometimes sending it to one or two people, sometimes sending it to all beings in this direction or they classically say, you know, in the front and the sides, behind. And then after about uh, 12 days, something happened in the retreat centre that I didn't really like it meant a disturbance to the retreat, and then something was triggered, you know. So all these things started to come up from the past and about difficulties in the project, and you know how it can be. And uh, I told my teacher about it, and he said something very nice. He said, um, you have to learn that, you know, worry is there, but you're not worried about the worry. <laughs> you know, he said, excitement can be there, but you're not excited because of the excitement. So that's what Ajahn Brown calls that double dukkha, which means like, in India they have bread called double roti, it means like it's twice as big as a chapati. <laughs> so it's like you're multiplying it just by your attitude, you know, by not wanting it to happen. And it was such a relief when he said that, because I always felt this teacher had kind of a very good image of me, you know, my, in my practice, and now I'm telling him that I've actually got what I maybe could identify as anger, and I don't consider myself angry, you know. <laughs> and he was just like, <laughs> so what? <laughs> you know, this is just nature, it's just part of the practice, it's, it's all about how you relate to it. So it, it turned it into quite a learning experience and I had a great retreat. And I also learned through that retreat how to develop my mind in a way that um, was very flexible. So I think this is another aspect of a soft mind. It's not only like the qualities of the mind which are soft, so like soft mind is something which, I don't know, to me it means a mind that's very kind and forgiving, maybe a lot of patience, you know, a kind of mind where you feel like it can come into contact with the world but things kind of bounce off it, you know, and the opposite of that is like a hard mind, I think Ajahn Brown calls it concrete mind, you know, <laughs> and in the suttas they say it's a brittle mind, you can just kind of imagine things coming in contact and it chips you know, bits of it chip off <laughs> uh, or even smashes completely or someone comes against it and they get smashed. So that's like a hard mind. So there's the quality of the mind, you know, which can be soft or which can be hard and the hard mind is the one with the hindrances. The soft mind is the one that, you know, develops, cultivates good states of uh, mind, gratitude, inspiration, etc. Um, but also in this retreat, you know, that was one level of working, but another level was um, <clears throat> learning how to be flexible with what we experience. So what I noticed when these things first came up for me in retreat was that I wanted to continue with the metta, you know, I wanted to get back into that. So I tried to send metta to the difficult people or the difficult situation, but it just wasn't working, you know. And at some point I realised, okay, I'm doing metta, but my mind's not soft because it's not flexible. So I'm just kind of forging down one path and not realising that there may be another route or another angle to come in at the situation from. So then, uh, yeah, the, the retreat was good because the teachers were talking about the gradual training. I don't know how versed you are with the suttas, but um, the path is very gradual. It's not only meditation. And um, it always starts with virtue, okay? So we're constantly cultivating our, our virtue. Um, gratitude is part of that. All the qualities I've talked about are part of that. They're the qualities we should be developing, you know, through our ethical conduct. 
and it's almost a measure of whether conduct's ethical or not. Yeah. Is it leading? Is this conduct leading to more kindness, or is it leading to more ego and, and sort of selfishness, or more sort of separation between myself and others? You know. So there's virtue, but then the next thing we were learning was uh, the sense restraint, and this is quite interesting. So this is more like when you're not in deep meditation, or when there's a lot of disturbance in the mind. Sometimes it's not the time to watch the breath or to practice metta. What you need to do at that time is just guard the mind. So this means putting the awareness at the senses, right? So for example, I walk out of the meditation and the thoughts start happening. I notice, okay, these thoughts are coming in. Like, what is the effect on my mind? So at that point, you're just, you're just watching and you're just kind of, in a way, keeping them a little bit at a distance. Yeah? So you're not letting them come right in and, and become the focus of your mind. And the same with sights and sounds and smells. You know, guarding the senses kind of means like not going into detail with these things, like allowing them to be there but a little bit at a distance. So this is very helpful, you know, when things are coming in. There's a nice sutta in the text that says it's like um the cow is used to grazing and eating grass. So that's the meditation practice. She's just focused on the object. She's just focused on eating, you know. But then when she has a calf, suddenly there's somebody to look after. You know, there's something that could go wrong. There's something there that's, you know, maybe a danger to that safety and that happiness with the full stomach. So, um, you know, she can still eat the grass, but part of the mind is also looking out for the calf. So it's also watching, okay, what's happening here? You know, is any danger coming from any, any angle? So it's a little bit similar with guarding the senses, yeah. So on the one hand you have the meditation, but also the things that are coming in to the meditation. Sometimes we need to catch them at the level of sound, sight, smell, before they kind of get to the point where they just start to take over, you know, obsess the mind. So this is also a kind of flexibility, knowing, you know, how much distance to take from the object. So the practice of breath meditation or metta is very close to the object, but the guarding the senses is quite distant. And then mindfulness is another kind of tool that has to be there throughout the practice, right? So we're mindful of thoughts, emotions, we're mindful of walking, bodily postures, or eating. So this can be there throughout as well, but this is a little bit closer than guarding the senses. Like you're a little bit more in touch with the body, but not very absorbed. Like if you're very absorbed, you know, in an object, say you try to drive a car, you're just absorbed like on the steering wheel or on the, even on the road, and you don't see the things coming from the sides. So you have to know which kind of distance to take from an object depending on the circumstance. You know, there's all these clichés about um, meditators from different traditions, and I think Ajahn Brahm tells a story about one conference he went to, and there was um, a group who did very slow walking meditation. And um, they called one of the nuns up to give a talk, and she thought, I must be mindful. So she walked so slowly, you know, to the microphone, really slowly, and everybody was, like, waiting. He said by the time she got there, there were five minutes to give the talk, you know? <laughs> so, yeah, on one hand you could say this is mindfulness, but is it, you, is it wisdom? Mindfulness should always go with wisdom, so it has to be adapted you know, to the situation. So I think this is also a very important part of practice, being able to adapt and know how we can practice in any situation. It's also quite a relief, you know, it, doesn't, it means you don't have to go home and, and get into deep, concentration or getting to deep insight, sometimes the mind's not in that position, so the best thing to do at that time is maybe some service or maybe go see a friend, do a little act of kindness, you know, or just sit down and watch the impressions, watch the sense impressions, just be aware of what's happening. Um, yeah. Are you, are you wanting to ask? Just I'm wondering about your sending your meta yeah. and then looking at a new angle. Do you have anything else to expand on there where you were finding new ways? New ways. New angles and, and new ways to send Okay, it? yeah. Uh, I think at that point in my retreat, I started bringing in different practices. 
So I continued to do meta, but I, I didn't do it all day long. So what I would do was wait to see, like, okay, what's the state of my mind now, and does it look like it's inclining in that direction, or does it look like I need to deal with the disturbances, first of all? So sometimes I felt like, okay, there's a hindrance there. Um, I could try and do the meta, but maybe I'd miss something, you know, with the hindrance, or miss something with the emotion that wants to be expressed or wants to be felt. So then I would practice more like my old practice, which is vipassana. I mean, there's many kinds of vipassana, but I would find it quite helpful to go to the sensations in the body and just experience what was going on there, because the body and the mind are so interrelated that it's always like a mirror. You know, if there's some kind of disturbance in the mind, it's usually there's some kind of stress or tension in the body. And I find that by going directly to the body, the mind tends to calm down. It also is quite interesting because it's a lot more variety with the body. I find it quite interesting and, and useful for a busy mind. Yeah? So it kind of calms things down, especially if you go sort of systematically through the body. So that used to help. And then, um, yeah, often after that, I'd feel like, right, I'm ready for metta now. And I practice metta again. And then when my mind felt strong enough in the metta, say with the, I used to start with a loved person. So, you know, you start with a friend or a benefactor, something like this. And the teacher was pumping out the metta on this retreat, so it was easy to give metta to him, you know. Mm -hmm. See this big smile and kind of sense of acceptance and just feel like, yeah, that's metta. So I'd tune up with that and say metta. And the amazing thing is that, um, I don't know if you've ever practiced kind of intensive metta, but once the mind is very soft and, and full of loving kindness, even the difficult situations appear differently. So the situations that were bothering me, if I would bring it up in that state of mind, it wouldn't seem such a problem, you know? Sometimes I even saw the people involved as kind of soft and cute, <laughs> or maybe just a bit insecure, you know, like going through difficulties. Yeah, just going through the same things I go through, you know? And there was that lack of separation. Because I think the hard mind always creates, like, bridges and separation between good, bad, wrong, right, this person I like, the person I dislike. It's kind of prejudice mind. So I notice when the mind's bigger and softer, then there's, that prejudice is sort of dissolves. So that was great. And um, sometimes it felt like the difficult person was just jumping into the flow, you know. I didn't kind of purposely send my meta to them, but they, they just kind of came and the meta continued to go. So it was a very nice retreat, and everyone was practicing something different in that retreat. Yeah. Will. Honorable Kanda, thank you for being here, for your presence. <laughs> thank um, you, too. I'm hoping that you can help me with the question that is really bringing about a lot of suffering. Okay. Question help for me. I'm really hoping to practice mindfulness of your name. Where, where's the bathroom? <laughs> Is that a serious question? Yeah. <laughs> Straight in the back and on the left. To the left. I'm really glad that you got kindness for your body. <clears throat> I was sure it was going to be an intellectual question because I've seen him on Facebook. <laughs> and uh, sometimes I'm, I'm up to it, sometimes I'm not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, do you want to go into questions now or shall I keep kind of waffling on? Yeah, because your question kind of um, <laughs> kind of brought me onto the another subject I wanted to talk about, which is um, I think the most interesting about when the mind's soft and malleable. I was going to read some suttas, but it's not happening yet. Anyway, <laughs> so especially with the practice of metta, I find it so conducive to insight because, like I say, things look different when you've got a mind of metta. So sometimes it's like, oh, the people look different, or a situation looks easier. Sometimes if you're in a good mood, you know, your thoughts are all on the positive kind of angle. And when you're in a difficult mood, or even just pain in the body, everything's going to go wrong, you know. You're going to end up on the streets, which for a nun is quite likely. So that's going to happen very soon. And, uh, <laughs> you know, the whole world looks... Uh, looks kind of harsh and, and uninviting and, you know, hostile. So I find this really interesting because it starts to question whether we can really rely on what we perceive, you know, on what we think is the reality. 
how calm it can change so easily depending on our state of mind. So to me that shows that there's a way, first of all it questions what we think of as reality. Okay, this is this situation, this person is like that, they've always been like that, they'll always be like that, there's no hope, you know. Um, yeah, so you start to see that perhaps you're wrong. And this already brings a lot of relief, to me anyway, because I'm quite an analytical person, so sometimes I can get really into that, even if it's not negative, you know, it's really analysing. And then when I say, OK, maybe that's just wrong, it's like, it just, the mind quietens right down. <laughs> so that's really interesting. And then you start to see how, you know, if the world is conditioned by the way we see it, then why not condition it in a way that leads to happiness? Yeah. We can mould it any way we want to, so why not have a look at what kind of uh, perceptions, what kind of views lead to the l mind becoming luminous, you know, to the mind becoming clear and bright and happy. So it's not crime, you know, to be happy if we're, if we're you know, getting that happiness from our own attitude, from our own kind of perception. So I really like this, this idea that you can see things in different ways and... Um, yeah, the Buddha talks in many suttas about all different kinds of perceptions you can use in the practice. So my practice initially was vipassana, which Sylvia knows about because we practice together. And there you um, very much focus on like the arising and passing of sensations, and that can lead to seeing the arising and passing of mental phenomena as well. But the problem came for me after a while, maybe 10 years of quite intensive practice, that everything I looked at was impermanent. Now that's okay because, you know, apparently that's the reality, okay? <laughs> but what I realised was that sometimes I wanted to see it a different way, like sometimes I wanted to watch the breath and just see the breath. And actually to get into deeper meditation you need to see the breath more as like a concept, more as like a whole thing. Like It's a kind of mental concept, it's not just particles, it's a breath. So you have the whole breath, the long breath, the short breath, you know, the Buddha talks about that. But for me, whenever I'd look at it, it was just vibrations immediately. And I realised that my mind, even though I thought it was soft because it was seeing this change, it was actually fixed in one perception. And I couldn't, you know, shift it to see things in another way. So that was when I really started to question that. And, and also, sometimes it looked as though the more I'd noticed change, the more it had changed, or the faster it had changed as if I was almost creating it, you know? And that's quite interesting as a principle in meditation because the same thing works for states like peace. So that's why when we practice now, I just said, like, notice the silence. Because what you notice tends to grow. It tends to kind of become predominant in the mind. So again, it's that kind of knowing how to tilt the mind or incline towards something that's going to bring happiness and peace. Sometimes you don't want happiness and peace, you just want insight or understanding, you know? So you have to know, okay, which, what does my mind need now and which way do I need to look or perceive in order to, you know, kind of uh, encourage that mental state. So I think this is really key. Yes? Um, so you spoke just now about um, conditioning the mind towards compassion. Yeah. And that's something that I don't really practice meta yet, and I... Um, every time I've thought about practicing it or even hear the term, there's just this like twing of aversion. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's kind of related to that concept because I felt as if it's something that should arise naturally. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, and it's, had, it's made me rethink just morals and ethics in general, and I think that, so that's something that should just arise as like a human being. But um, can you speak a little bit about that? If yeah, you have anything else sure. To say? I think it's a natural potential of the human heart, but it's a cultivation. Like in the in the Buddha suttas, it's definitely in the category of something to be developed. Yeah. So the Buddha talks about it as a wholesome state, and you know one of the right efforts is to notice the wholesome states and not to, you know, to keep them, not to let them sort of degenerate, but also to increase them. So there is something to be done, and there is an attitude you can adopt to, to. Um, look at things in a more compassionate way. So I always think of the Brahma Viharas as working in two levels. So first of all, there's like compassion or metta as an attitude of mind. 
And that's kind of what we did in the meditation. So at least I was trying to convey, you know, that we can look at experience with an attitude of, of kindness and compassion and it can change the way we experience it, actually. You know, things soften. Whereas when you look at them like, I don't want this pain, you know, it just gets harder and more contracted. So that's one way of uh, practicing compassion. And that's nice because it's very much... Um, it's not like a layer on top of anything. It's 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 just wise perception. It's just wise view. And you're still very much with whatever's happening. And then the other is cultivating compassion and metta. And I always think um, I think it's good to start with the attitude because we need some metta towards ourselves first of all. But then uh, it's quite useful if you're doing formal practice to start to like say if you're doing metta. It's good to send metta, choose an object that's easy, choose an object that's like not too difficult, so somebody you have a very simple relationship with. Sometimes you could even choose an animal or like a little puppy or something. Or a kangaroo. I don't know if you've been to Australia, but the little ones are so cute. And uh, they're so cute. Um, and then you just wish well. And it's like, you can either stimulate the metta through thoughts, so may this being be well and happy. Think about what you really wish for them, you know, make it personal. And then, like, between the thoughts, you have to feel, you have to give chance for the feeling. So it's not just like a mental thing, but it's like you say the thought and then you feel, you feel the heart. You kind of, it's like you're pointing the mind in a direction and you're seeing whether it wants to follow. You're just encouraging it to follow that, that way. But the compassion is a bit different, and um, this is another way that you see how soft and malleable the mind is, because it tends to depend on the object you pick. So the, it's kind of like love in a different form, and it's like I always define compassion as like love's response to suffering. So it's like when it meets suffering, how does love respond? It's not really appropriate to say, okay, to somebody who, say, had a tragedy happen. I mean, one of my friends just lost her son just very recently, and um, it was a tragic, it was tragic. He jumped out of a building. He had bipolar disorder. Um, and I had to write her a letter, you know, to say, I've heard about this, and, you know, how are you? It wouldn't have been appropriate for me to say, may you be happy, you know, because she's not happy. And that's like asking her to do something that's impossible. So in that kind of situation, I mean, the, the wish tends to change into something like may you be free from suffering, or may you be able to hold your pain, you know, with kindness, or something like this. So compassion is more like a wish for someone to uh, come out of suffering, and it focuses on them being free of suffering. So it's not like you get bogged down in it, you focus on, like, the idea of their freedom from suffering. So, um, yeah. And I think you can use all of these in daily life. You can use them even as a kind of, just a thought in your mind during meditation. It's quite useful when, you know, you're struggling with something yourself, or say there's a horrible thought going round and round your mind that's just getting you down. You can just say, you know, may I, like, may I be able to hold my pain with kindness. It's just like adding, it's putting in a different thought and a much kinder thought, and it takes you out of the content. So there's many, many ways you can do it. But if you want to do it classically, like say you're on a long retreat, normally the way is to start with metta and then to practice metta to quite a high level, like, you know, as much as you can, like, until it's, quite, until it's flowing. And then just change the object a little bit. So once I was doing metta to my best friend, and then I didn't mean to start doing compassion, but I thought of a lady who was one of my supporters in Burma, and she was a very poor lady, very old, well, not very old, but she'd been through a lot, you know. She was actually very wise. Um, and one of these people that's just, like, a salt of the earth, you know. Do you have that phrase here? She's like a rock. She's, she's there for everyone, even though she's had terrible tragedies in her life. So I started sending meta to her, and there was a different emotional response. It was compassion. I identified it as compassion. And it felt like, wow, the mind is so wise, you know. It knows what's needed, and it starts to respond in that way to to the situation so yeah so I think it's kind of a natural um, it can come naturally if you're doing it in a, a more intensive way yeah <laughs> does that help at all is it practical yeah okay 
So, if anybody, does anyone else have a question? Because I've got questions otherwise. <laughs> have we got time? Yeah, we've got loads of time. How did you meet Aya Yeshi? Oh, <laughs> okay, then I have to tell the whole story, right? So Ayesha is a nun who's Australian, um, and I lived in Australia, so that's where I met her. She's um, uh, she comes over here nowadays quite a lot. Um, she's quite amazing, and you know, it's very much respect of her compassionate work actually, because she's been helping in India with um, she's been living at, more or less in a slum in Nagpur, so with children who really have nothing, and often they don't have any education, or you know, they're in poverty or Sometimes they're in violent situations, abusive situations. And um, she's got a small little temple there, and um, yeah, and she serves. And I think she's established schools, she's established um, some kind of health care, and sometimes she does like temporary ordinations. She, she gives them a kind of, um, I don't know what you'd call it, kind of makeshift robe. It's a kind of symbolic robe, but it's sort of pink, a bit like the Burmese robes. And um, they get a feel, you know, for how it is to shave their head and wear the same as everyone else and, and learn more about Buddhism in that form. Um, so she does a lot of amazing work. And I met her in, uh, in Australia, in one of the monasteries over there. Yeah. It was a monastery that um, at that time didn't have really an abbot or a training system. So people who didn't have a base, you know, or were doing something quite unusual tended to come there because it would sort of accept everybody and you didn't have to sort of stay for a set period of time or take up a different training because there's all kinds of different um, branches of Buddhism. So it was a Theravada monastery but she was a Mahayana nun. Uh, so she came and, and I've met her over here a couple of times. Yeah, I yeah. yeah, she's good. Yeah. So there's a, lot, a network, you know, for, for Buddhist nuns. There's not many of us yet, actually. Yeah. Really not many. So we tend to know each other. And if you meet someone you don't know, it's like, oh, wow, another one, you know? It's like, wow, a whole new world. That could, yeah, like this one could be a teacher. They could have a monastery. It's like seeds, you know, that are getting planted slowly around the world. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of disrobal though as well. I say planted, but, you know, there's a lot of uprooting too because it's hard to, to grow roots when there's no support. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Did you put your hand up? No, no, that's all right. <laughs> I mean, I have a lot of textbook questions, but it's too, it's too long. It's yeah, I want practical. <laughs> I want practical. So I'll ask you a couple of questions, yeah? So, Because I want to explore this idea of a hard mind and a soft mind. So, because it's helpful. So I want to know if there's any particular situations like where you kind of can sense what I'm talking about, like hard mind. So when the mind starts to contract or feel separate or start to turn inwards, like what kind of situations cause that to happen and, and how does it feel? Yeah. When I'm talking about subjects that I'm uncomfortable with, oh, yeah. that require decisions. <laughs> that require... And decisions, particularly if I'm discussing something that I care, with someone I care about and the words that I choose will have consequences. Uh-huh. Uh, uh -huh. Or when I'm hungry. Oh, when both, you're hungry, yeah. Both, both is a really bad thing. Okay, yeah, interesting. Really interesting, yeah. Your hunger's true. I can relate to that, especially as a child. Uh, but the, um, the one about, um, you know, wanting to be careful about what you say because you care about the consequences, right? Yeah. With someone you care about. Yeah. I wonder, I mean, there's something beautiful in that too, isn't there? What, what point does it turn into something... Because there's something beautiful in that, I mean... I get kind of brittle. Brittle, yeah. Brittle. Like, like, I'm not... Uh, the, I, I'm not really able to respond fluidly. Mm. Like, I, like I, I feel like I'll just need a little bit of time in the office, and then yeah. I'll be able to get back to the conversation. Okay, but yeah. the question's right there right now, and I have to have some sort of response. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So how could you soften uh, that? In the past, sometimes, just acknowledging that myself or the other person has worked. Yes. Um, yeah. but I don't always, that, that can kind of form its own drive, I don't always come up with an opportunity. 
sabe? That can form its own drive. I can think, oh, I need to somehow divert this. I need to, I need to bring this into conversation, bring this into awareness. So yeah. That I, I'm less inappropriate, but I don't actually find an opportunity. All the time. Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 That makes a lot of sense. Like to um, to acknowledge how you're feeling. Is that what you meant, first of all? Yeah. Like to actually maybe even express to that person, like, yeah, I'm really not sure what to say because I don't want to hurt you right now. <laughs> You know? Yeah. And just to touch that vulnerability, it's kind of vulnerability. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's a, that's a good description for it, because a lot of times, even when I'm trying to acknowledge it, I'll be shooting for something else. Don't want to quite touch the vulnerability, want to address yeah. it without mentioning yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's great to notice, because I think, um, personally, I think like the closer we come to vulnerability, the, the closer we are to something quite precious. Because it's a kind of, like, a lot of our persona or our behaviour in life is to kind of protect that part of ourselves, you know, to keep it hidden. Yeah. Yeah, because we don't want people to see it. We don't want to break down, you know, in front of people. It's really hard in a monastery. I mean, I went through a phase where I was really depressed and it was very hard for me to keep showing up, you know. And I was really worried that I'd have to cry in public, you know. I really didn't want that to happen. And one day it had to happen, you know, I was sitting there and I was just, I couldn't hide it, you know. Yeah. And I said to myself, well, you just got to go in there and have lunch. And I was sitting there with a red face. Oh, it was horrible. One woman did look at me like, ooh. <laughs> but it felt like a relief. It's like, I don't, need to ha- I don't need to pretend that nuns are always happy, you know. We're not always happy. It's like any, any situation, it's, it's tough. And sometimes there's no way to hide. And after a while, I started to kind of go down that path more and more and decide, okay, I'm just going to let myself be vulnerable. Sometimes I'd actually be kind of almost trembling. Not for any reason, you know, just because it's a mental state that comes up. And I feel like, oh yeah, I just want to stay in my hut today. But you couldn't, you know, you had to go and do a bit of work and things like this. And uh, yeah. I remember a close friend of mine in that monastery. We became closer during that time. Um, one day she'd said something to the community about me that was a bit, she made an assumption and she felt bad about it afterwards and she came to me and she said, I'm really nervous about this but you've taught me to be vulnerable and I just want to tell you that um, I said such and such and I shouldn't have said it and I was just so touched, you know, I was like, oh I'm so glad you could tell me and it's just so great if me being vulnerable has helped her to be vulnerable. Yeah, so it was a, like a melting, you know, like a, and since then we've been so close, it's, um, yeah, you sort of feel like when you've gone to that sort of point where you're kind of getting a bit on stuck, you know, which happens in monastic life, it's kind of the point in a way, like the ego is starting to get seen for what it is and that can be scary, but once that kind of happens and you meet in a much more authentic way, it's, um, you feel very at ease with the person, you know, yeah. after that. And with yourself and your... Because some friends, you know, you can show them only a few mental states. Other friends, you can show them more of yourself. Um, <laughs> yeah. And we need to become our own friend who we can show everything to, you know. <laughs> so we can show our whole self to ourself. Because <laughs> we have to see it all, you know. You have to see what's there before you can, like, understand it and then ultimately let go yeah yeah thanks for sharing that's really interesting <laughs> yeah no i got the gift again sorry got the gift again me no me, me. oh <laughs> go on then i was you know i always got a lot of questions mine say no um i was going to say because i think the initial question was about how do you develop the soft mind in harder instances situations and circumstances mm. and because you know I got my work clothes on but I thought of initially was how in uh, the workplace past progression just kind of always shows up and it's sometimes I guess pressure kind of contributes mm. to I guess the drive to succeed mm-hmm. and I'm a bit at a, you know a little bit of a catch-22 because it's like what do you want to do then do you want to you know bite at people or do you want to I guess Try and be more equanimous and more compassionate. But mm. if you do, if you try mm. to maintain that intention to be harmless, 
people just start to eat at you. So. Yeah. So the question's about the workplace and passive aggression and um, how you kind of deal with that. Do you try to be compassionate to the people that are trying to kind of get at you? Or, or what? Oh, wow. Or I, I do you try and, what, no, you, oh, do you try to become more equanimous? Yeah? Yeah, well, I'm with the lady, situation. I've been finding my own solution to it. I just, mm. know, sometimes you gotta tell soft, or sometimes you gotta tell truth in a kind, yeah. passionate way, and sometimes you gotta tell it in a hard fashion. Well, I think you do have to have boundaries. That's something I'm trying to learn, because I've never really had to have that. <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> I've, you know, I've been to India, and I've been around good people, meditation. I mean, you have to be a bit streetwise when you're young in India, on your own, you're a bit of a target, but um, it's only recently that I've had to have that, have boundaries, and I'm just starting to learn them, and I think sometimes it's compassionate to actually say to somebody, this behaviour of yours has this effect, is there anything you could kind of, or even just tell them, you don't have to ask for anything, but if you just let somebody know in a kind way, you know, not in a judging way, or like, you're terrible, but like, when you do this, this is how I feel, and I find that difficult, or sometimes you can ask the question, like, is there anything, or could you try to exercise more sensitivity around that, or could you be aware, like, when you start to criticise me, for example, that kind of thing. If, they're, if you're able to talk to someone, not everyone can be talked to, and sometimes, yeah, equanimity, if you really can't change the situation, just <coughs> accept, okay, this is that person, they are the owner of their karma, Right? This is the way they're conditioned. Perhaps you'd be the same if you'd been conditioned like that. Um, but it's their karma ultimately, and as long as I maintain my, you know, I don't fall in, I don't start retaliating in the same way, then uh, I have to let it go. And other times I think you need to uh, reconsider your environment, you know. Um, yeah, the Buddha said very clearly. I don't know if it was only for the monastics. I think it's a principle that applies in general. He said that um, if you're in a situation where the wholesome states are increasing and the, the wholesome states are decreasing and the unwholesome states are increasing, he said, don't even stay a day and a night. I think that's for the monastics. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you have to be careful there because you know, perhaps it's just a bad day. So, I mean, I do stay longer than that, but if I see over time that this is definitely not working, I've tried to change my attitude, I've tried to, I don't know, try different ways, you know, to cope with the situation. Try to check whether I feel the same in a different situation. And if I do, then maybe it's me. But if I go to another situation and it's much better for me, then maybe there's something in the situation. So then he does say change that, you know. And um, right. associating with wise people is like the whole of the path. It's actually a very important part of the path. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. Um, I think in another situation in which the mind really tends to close up and become tight, um, and I'm sure I would experience this to a greater degree if I was a person of color, say, but walking on the street and starting to get self-conscious and insecure because you wonder what other people think of mm. you objectively as a person. Try um, this. <laughs> 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 no, 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 I know. <laughs> that's a perfect example. I think that's why you wear that, right? Sorry? That's why you wear that. Though. Well, the funny thing is, you know, like the whole point of wearing a rose was to be invisible, but of course if you take an ancient Indian tradition out of India, <laughs> or out of a situation where there are loads of nuns, and you put yourself in the West in the 21st century, it's kind of a bit different. You suddenly become really conspicuous. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> normally nobody bothers but the only place in the whole world and I've travelled everywhere not everywhere but you know widely really widely, cities, towns all over the world and the only place where anybody said anything was my hometown and this guy said to me uh, something like uh, talk about wanting to stand out or something talk about well, that's a good way to get attention, they say, yeah. That's a good way to get attention, he said. <laughs> it's so funny. 
<laughs> like I did it, you know, to get attention. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's really true, though, isn't it? Because it's um, as soon as you feel like um, that's the sense of self and other again. It's that sense of separation. Like I'm here and they're there, and they're looking at me, and I'm separate from them. You know, and you have this sense that your world is like everybody's looking at you. The most important thing in the world to everybody is you on the street. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I have it too. I know that feeling. <laughs> it's really funny. My teacher says, you know, there's a, I don't know if I can get this right, but he says something like, uh, the first part of your life you think everybody's, uh, you're worried about what everybody's thinking about you. The second part, or something like you're thinking about what you think about everybody else or something, because you become quite, you know, judgmental. And then the last part of your life you realise no one was ever thinking about you anyway. It's <laughs> 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 quite good, no? <laughs> I had to tell another funny story because I talked about it on the train with my friend because someone uh, <laughs> sent me an email today and she's quite a funny lady actually. She works on our project and she said, um, good luck tonight. And I completely, I really hadn't thought about coming here very much, you know, I was a bit worried that I'd have nothing to say because I hadn't thought about it. Um, and I thought she meant have a good sleep tonight, so I said, oh, oh, I just realised you meant good luck with the talk. And then she said, oh yeah, good luck with the talk and with sleep, or good luck with sleep and the talk. And I said, and I thought she meant good luck sleeping while you talk, like, good luck. <laughs> or something like that. Anyway, then I remembered that there is actually a, a story about a monk who um, was so relaxed and so at ease with himself that he was actually giving a Dhamma talk and he fell asleep. It's a true story, and he fell asleep during the Dhamma talk. So that's how relaxed he was. And then when he woke up, he started just from the same place <laughs> where he left off. <laughs> oh, it was really funny. And then I was thinking, is that a soft mind, or is that just like a drowsy mind, or what? <laughs> yeah, it's a sleepy mind. I think I, think I concluded to myself that um, like a certain amount of relaxation is a soft mind, but if you're going into drowsiness, it's again one of the hindrances, yeah? So actually it's a hard state, because it's a fixed one. You, can't, you don't have any choice anymore. Like, you can't say, okay, uh, let me direct my mind to impermanence or, you know, whatever, which is a characteristic of a soft mind. A soft mind, you can direct your mind to anything you want to know about and your mind sustains its attention on that phenomenon. But a drowsy mind, it's kind of under the control of, of drowsiness, basically. So, yeah. But I thought it was funny and worth sharing. So I didn't go to sleep tonight, so, <laughs> so we're doing okay. <laughs>